What do you believe about the end of the world? There's a simple question, huh? <laughs> the judgment day, the end times, the last day. I have this guy from my church who maybe every month or two forwards me an email or sends me a text with a link and it's about something crazy happening in the world, something cultural, something that feels very unchristian. And he always wonders, is this the end? Like, have things gotten so bad that the moment has arrived and the world is about to wrap up? And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm sometimes tempted to, you know, make light of, of his fear. But did you know in the Bible, actually in the New Testament, nearly every single book that makes up the New Testament mentions the end of the world? In the teachings of Jesus and the gospel, Peter, Paul, James, one of the biggest threads besides the gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that the world will not just keep going, it will one day end. And so it's not a strange question to ask you, what do you personally believe about the end of the world? What are your spiritual convictions about when it will end or how it will end or what exactly will happen when that day comes or if that day is going to come and where will you stand when that day comes? Well, those are the kind of questions I want to answer with you uh, today and in the next few videos. And it's really interesting to me that Jesus' friend Peter, when he wrote two letters in the New Testament, 1st and 2nd Peter, even though they're very short letters, he spent one entire chapter trying to answer questions about the end of the world. Uh, in my Bible, the title is The Day of the Lord. So in 2nd Peter, chapter 3, uh, I just want to walk you through verse by verse and see what we can learn about the return of Jesus Christ from the words of one of Jesus' closest friends. So, this is how the chapter begins. 2 Peter chapter 3 says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. This is 2 Peter, right? Not first. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior, through your apostles. So there's the big goal, right? Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles speaking, having heard from Jesus. <laughs> the goal is to stimulate you to wholesome thinking, not get your thoughts wrapped up in bad, unbiblical places. And here's what he says next, verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where's this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But, but they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world at that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Whoa. All right, P Peter, he's on blast, right? He says, above all, you need to know this. Christians, you must understand this. And what does he want us to understand? That tons of people won't buy this. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. Not just people who are unsure or those who have questions, but scoffing, mocking, jabbing, making memes about it. Oh, yeah, 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 the end of the world, right? That's what grandpa said. That's what great-grandpa said. That's what these Christians have always been saying, but nothing happens. Everything just keeps going on. Have you noticed that? It seems that many people in our culture are convinced that the world could end because of a global pandemic or nuclear war or climate change or an asteroid or a zombie apocalypse or the, the, you know, they will believe some pretty out there things. But many people will not believe the simple fact that one day Jesus Christ himself will appear in the air, the world will end and all of humanity will be judged. And so Peter wants you to know this, but before the tide of culture pulls you away to think that the judgment day is just something foolish, it's just something those extreme Christians do, Peter, who walked with Christ himself, says you must understand this, he's coming back. 
Just like God promised in his word that the flood would come, and it did, Jesus has promised in his word that the end will come, and it will. Now, friends, you are not weird, and you are not crazy to believe in a judgment day. Now, let me leave you with this. Um, did you know that some of the earliest Christians, when they tried to figure out exactly what Christianity was about, they came up with a creed. Uh, if you've gone to church for a while, you might have heard of it, the Apostles' Creed. It wasn't written by the apostles themselves, it was written by those who followed them, very early, maybe 2nd century, 100s AD. And in that creed, they said, you know, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And they talked about he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, was buried. They talk about the, the gospel and what Jesus did for us. He ascended into heaven. He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And from there, he will come to do what? To judge the living and the dead. So take your stand with the earliest Christians. Don't be embarrassed of what believers have stood for for the longest time. Yes, you must understand that scoffers will come, but Jesus is coming back. Believe him. The good news is on the way. One day Jesus will appear and we will celebrate like never before. He promised it. I pray you believe it. Amen. I feel too cheated to worship. That's what Vince Neil, uh, the lead rock singer from the band Motley Crue, once said. I feel too cheated to worship. I don't know much about Vince or his story or his music, but, but I do know this, that he had a baby girl named Skylar. And Skylar, when she was really little, got cancer. And uh, I can't imagine as a father watching your little kid having to go through that. And I can't imagine as a father what happens when she doesn't get through that. You see, at age four, Skylar died. And soon afterwards, Vince Neil said, I feel too cheated to worship. Yeah, his story is really one of the biggest objections that people make to the God I believe in and to this book that I adore. If God is so good, if, if God is so powerful, if God can end pain and relieve our suffering, if he cares about us like he claims to, then why is this world the way that it is? Why do kids get cancer? Why do people battle depression? Why do innocent spouses get betrayed? Why do we deal with, with back pain and drama and tornadoes and tsunamis, natural disasters and pandemics. If, if God is running the show, if he's good, why doesn't he fix it? It's a common question. In fact, there's a fancy name for that. It's called theodicy. How can God be just? How can God be good if he has all the power and all the love and the world looks so much like this? You know, in these videos, we're talking about the end of the world the day when Jesus comes back and he ends all of the cancer, all the depression, all of the pain, all of the crying, all of the questions. And so it's, it's valid to ask, why doesn't he just do it? I mean, if Jesus is in total control, he could, he could come back today and he could end all of that. Why doesn't he just do it? It's interesting to me that here in 2 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> one of Jesus' closest friends answers that question. You know, for those of us who are waiting, those of us who are aching for all of the, the drama and pain to end, for Jesus to return, why hasn't it happened yet? Here's Peter's answer. 2 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You catch that answer? Well, why is God being so patient? Why is he waiting? If he could end the pain, why hasn't it happened? Here's Peter's simple answer. God is patient with you. Because he doesn't want any one of you to perish, 
to be lost eternally, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. That means God wants every single person to change their mind, to realize that they are sinners who need to be saved, and to look to Jesus and his cross for their salvation. Actually, I bet you get this concept, that we would allow or even ask people that we care about to suffer because we care deeply about someone else. This is a trivial example. Imagine your dog took off out of the yard and, and you were worried sick. I know some of you love your pets like your own children, and so you're panicked, you, you can't sleep, and so you reach out to family and friends and you ask them to help you find your dog. Now, you're keeping your friends up late. Maybe it's past their bedtime. Maybe they have better things to do than drive around a neighborhood calling out your dog's name. But I bet you would still do it. And why? Well, you care about them. Why, why would you make their lives more uncomfortable? And the simple answer is, is because you, you care about your dog. You want your dog to be in an accident. You don't want your dog to be lost. You want to bring your dog home. That's kind of like God. There are people that he loves deeply, those who don't believe in him just yet. This is crazy to think about. God loves his enemies so profoundly that he says to his sons and daughters, just wait. I know it's hard. I'm going to get you through it. My son is coming back soon, but just wait because I care so much about them. I got a shocking reminder of that just three days ago. I was hosting week one of a small group Bible study and everyone was gathered around the table and we began just by telling our stories, our, our names, our hobbies, our passions, our jobs, and a little bit of the background of our spiritual lives. And what was stunning to me was the fact that if Jesus would have come back five years ago, half the people at that table would have been lost forever. She had just met Jesus in 2019. She didn't know about this God of love until 2018. His life was turned upside down in 2016. Like, if Jesus would have pushed the button, if he would have pulled the trigger, if he would have ended my suffering since I was already saved, these people that I care about, that God cares about, would have been lost. And such a vivid reminder to me that although today might not be easy for me or for you, although we might have to go through chemo and cancer, we might have to take our medication and and battle that depression, God has a great reason. And so we trust him. Let me leave you today once more with these words. Don't forget this one thing. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Let's pray. Uh, Dear God, please give us patience as we rely on your patience to save people we care about. You were patient with us until we heard the law and the gospel about our sin and your grace and we're saved. And we pray, God, now that you would give us patience too. You have not cheated us. We can worship you today because you have been so good to us in Christ. Give us the strength and endurance to wait for that glorious day when he returns and use us to carry out this mission to save more and more people in your son's name. It's because of Jesus we pray. Amen. I almost crashed our family minivan when I saw the billboard just outside of Detroit. Uh, Thankfully, I kept it on the road, but as a Christian, the billboard demanded my attention. It listed a date, May 21st, 2011, the end of the world. And then in one of those big kind of like star advertising things to get your attention, it said, the Bible guarantees it. I'm not sure if you heard, (laughs) but apparently it doesn't. It's crazy, huh? Like, I know how much billboards cost. In a big city like Detroit, I can't imagine how much a billboard costs right alongside the interstate. And yet someone spent that much money to make a prediction of when the end of the world would come. That wasn't the last time. It was far from the first time. It happens almost all the time that people who are so curious about this, the return of Jesus, they speculate if it's this date or that one, if it's this year or next one. And this actually happens in my church too. I wonder if you found yourself in this place. You, you read the headlines, 
you look at the craziness, the politics, the disasters, what's happening in culture and in the world, and you, you say to yourself, this has to be it. Like, it, it's going to happen in my lifetime, people from my church have told me. Is that legit? Well, the Apostle Peter wants to answer that question. If you recall, in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, we have this extensive teaching about the return of Jesus, the day of the Lord. And here's what Peter says in chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Everything exposed when Jesus comes back in this glorious, epic, unmissable day. But did you catch the first sentence? The day of the Lord will come like a thief. Let's break that down. It will come. Right? Some people will scoff, mock, doubt, couldn't happen, whatever. Other people have said it before, couldn't be today. No, Peter said it, it will come. Bank on it. Jesus promised it. But it will come like a thief. So uh, I personally have been a thief thrice. <laughs> uh, in my childhood, I actually stole from a store three different times. Can I confess these sins to you? Once at uh, Cole's uh, department store, when I was maybe seven, there was this G.I. Joe I really wanted. <laughs> and so I went to the toy section. I separated from my mom. I got the G.I. Joe. I actually remember I, I climbed up inside one of those circular clothing racks where no one could see me. I was, I was huddled there. I opened the packaging. I looked at this amazing G.I. Joe and I put it in my pocket, which was incredible. Until I got home and my mom saw it. So I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you the rest of that story some other time. Then there was this uh, gardening place called Steins in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where I grew up. And for some reason, they had baseball and hockey cards at Steins. And two different times when I was a little bit older, I, I stole from them as well. I since have sent Steins an email apologizing for my sin, just in case you're concerned. <laughs> but do you know what happens uh, or what happened with all three of those occurrences at Kohl's and at Steins? They had no clue. And why didn't they have a clue? Because thieves like me didn't give them a clue. I didn't call up Coles and tell them, hey, I'm about to steal a G.I. Joe. I just did it. And here's what Peter says. <laughs> Jesus isn't a thief, but the Lord Jesus will come like a thief. He's not going to tell us when it happens. So save your billboard money. Don't waste your time trying to crack some Jesus code. Many foolish people have done that in the past and now they look dumb. So my biblical advice to you is, don't look dumb. It's actually an important part of theology that I hope you embrace. It's called the hiddenness of God. All right, God is God. He knows everything. He knows a, a billion things. And 99% of them he has not revealed to you or to me because he hasn't put them in this book. What he has revealed, what he's like, what we're like, what Jesus did, how to be saved, that's as clear as can be. Let's focus on the revelation of God. Here's what we shouldn't do. Try to figure out what God has not revealed. What does God think? What does God want me to do? Is there a whisper? Is, is there a nudge? Um, Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says, The hidden things belong to God, but the things revealed belong to us. It's so important when it comes to the end times. We don't want to give mockers and scoffers another reason to mock and scoff. So let's back off on the predictions. Let's stop saying it's going to happen in my lifetime. We just know the Bible says soon. Be ready today. Focus on living a godly life. That's when the Bible says Jesus will return. It's a good message for us to know. Let's pray. Jesus, it could be today or it could be in 2,000 years. For some of us, the fact that the world could end today seems crazy. And for some Christians, the fact that it could go on another 2,000 years seems crazy. But biblically, neither is crazy. You have said that you will come, but you will come like a thief. So help us to be content with the things that you have revealed. 
to believe this truth that it will happen, and to focus on living holy and godly lives that people would be drawn to you, repent of their sins, and be ready for that day comes, whenever it comes. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. I once had a preaching class where the professor said, every time you're standing up there in front of a church, I want you to pretend I'm sitting in the back row and I'm just mouthing a single question at you. So what? So you read chapter one to me. So what? So you made your three points and told a fun story. So what? Uh, it was his pretty blunt way of saying that every good message from the Bible deserves an application to real life. And I think that applies, too, to the return of Jesus. So what? We said previously that the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Okay, so what? <laughs> so if we're not supposed to crack the, the code and speculate about the date, what exactly should we do as we wait for Jesus to return? Uh, I love the fact that in Second Peter chapter 3, the Apostle Peter directly answers that question. Here's what he says in chapter 3, verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. I love that question. What what kind of people ought you to be? Like renting a bunker, buying canned goods, making predictions, posting crazy things on the internet. No, Peter says, here's what you should do. Live holy and godly lives. Holy means separate from sin. It means different in a wonderful, beautiful, biblical way. Godly means like God compassionate, courageous, caring about truth and love at the same time. That's what Peter says. Don't, don't speculate about the date. Instead, focus your time, energy, and prayers on living the most godly life you can. It's pretty interesting. In Peter's first letter, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, he speaks to wives who have husbands who don't believe in Jesus. And it's this really classic line because, you know, sometimes when someone doesn't believe in Jesus, we want to like wear them out with our words. We want to warn them about their sin. We want to preach the gospel to them. And that can be good. But Peter says to these wives, I want you to live such holy and reverent lives that you win your husbands over without words. Right? So, so Peter knows. Remember putting this all together? Like Jesus is waiting in heaven because he wants people to repent and be saved. What sometimes brings people to the word of God, to repentance and faith? It's wives living holy lives. It's Christians dedicating themselves to being holy and godly in this very dark world. It's not just gloom and doom, marching signs, putting up billboards and making predictions. It's people who are abnormally loving and generous and compassionate and kind. It's Christians who maybe don't agree with their unbelieving friends, but they still love them and serve them and sacrifice for them. It makes them wonder what makes you different, which gives us an opportunity to preach the gospel, which gives them an opportunity to believe the gospel, which gives Jesus another reason to come back sooner rather than later. So what? The preacher said. Here's what. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. Uh, it makes me think of this guy I just ran 10 miles with. Uh, I love doing distance running, which might seem crazy to you. <laughs> but when you run distance with someone, you get to talk about everything because it's a long distance. <laughs> and I ran with this guy who was a couple years sober. And he started telling me the story of how he used to party really hard, drinking drugs throughout all of high school. And there's this really passionate Christian that he knew that was inviting him to church, that was loving on him well. But this guy that I was running with was a, a mocker, scoffer. He blew off all this Christianity, goody, goody, why would I bother? Don't want to wake up, got no time for it. Until years later. 
years later when his addiction caught up with him, when his life was a mess, when he kind of came back realizing he needed a, a higher power, he, he needed Jesus, who did he instantly think about? This guy. The guy he used to mock. The Christian who used to be rejected. It's such a great reminder that we might not persuade people today, but give it some time. <laughs> and I actually love this story. This, this guy told me, I, I was trying to find this old classmate of mine. I was looking him up on Facebook. I couldn't find him. I was reaching out to other classmates. I couldn't find him until I went to the sauna at the YMCA. And there I am, naked, the guy says. And who walks into the sauna also naked? The guy I was looking for. <laughs> it was the most awkward reuniting of people ever. <laughs> and he shared his new faith and he asked him, and where did this guy who was just sober start attending church? At the same church of this guy he used to mock. Now, Peter's words are powerful when you make them personal. What kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. May that be you. May that be me. God, let it be so. Amen. So what do you think the judgment day will be like? One day, the Bible says Jesus will return with all of his angels. He will raise the dead from their graves. He will judge all of humanity. But the minute after that's over, what will it be like? You know, the Bible says it's, it's going to last forever. It's eternal life after all. So that's actually a pretty important question. What, what do you think forever will be like? Now, the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 is doing this extensive teaching on the day of the Lord. And he answers that question in a couple of really short phrases that mean everything to me. Here's what Peter said. He said, in keeping with his promise, God's promise, we Christians are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Hmm. That's good, huh? Well, let me break that down. Peter uses the word new. Like, you and I are way too used to the old earth, the earth we live on now. It's a place where there's always something that's wrong. Things are great with your finances, but they're not with your health. Or you're super healthy, but your family's all jacked up. Or your family's happy, but your boss is ticked at you. Or your boss loves you, but the world seems like it's falling apart. There's always something to make us mourn or weep or cry, gnash our teeth or, or beg God for things to be different. But Peter drops this beautiful little word in there. He says, we are looking forward to, right? We're, we're straining our necks to see it. We, we, we can't wait till it happens. We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. And then he drops this beautiful phrase on us, where the new earth is the place where righteousness dwells. Right? The word dwell in the Bible is the opposite of a quick visit. When family maybe comes over to your house for Thanksgiving or you go to a Christmas party, that's not dwelling, that's stopping by. That's visiting. A, a dwelling is the place where you live permanently. And check this out. On the new earth, it's the place where righteousness dwells. That's a loaded biblical word that essentially means where everything is right. Nothing is wrong. Righteousness dwells here. You know, the thing about my life and your life right now is that righteousness occasionally visits us. We have days where things are all right, but righteousness doesn't dwell right here. Some people are right with God. They have righteousness through faith in Jesus, but other people aren't. But on the new earth, righteousness dwells forever and ever. Everything is right. The book of Revelation is where Jesus says there's no mourning or weeping or crying or pain. He says, the old order of things has passed away. And I love this line from our Savior. He says, behold, I am making everything new. And that is why I am so glad that my real estate friends are wrong. <laughs> and not to pick on those of you who are in real estate, but I feel like the trend these days is to use this marketing pitch that real estate agents will help us to find our 
forever home. <laughs> Have you heard of that? <laughs> now, maybe I'm, I'm too biblical and snarky, but I'll be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, you can give me a home for a, a few years, maybe a few decades, but my forever home, what I'm looking forward to so desperately is the new earth where righteousness dwells. So, brothers and sisters in the faith, I know this old earth is hard. I know things are not always right. I know you and I are aching for Jesus to just come back and, and end it and let the celebration begin. Be patient. Be saving people. Be faithful even if people mock it. Don't do crazy things and make predictions. Live holy and godly lives because a day is coming soon, very soon, when righteousness will dwell with you, with me, and with God forever. Come quickly, Jesus. Amen.